So thank you for joining me. Uh, week 11, break-even analysis and depreciation. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here shortly and we will start going through um, the PowerPoint. It's not a very long PowerPoint, but it does talk about the two different things that we've been looking at, break-even depreciation and why it matters. Um, if you have any questions, as always, please jump on the chat or the microphone, um, share your cameras and your screens. That would be really cool too. Okay. All right, so first of all, um, I'm gonna keep it just on this layout. Sometimes when I use a presentation mode, it, it goes crazy, it goes to different monitors. So if you're okay with it, I'm gonna do that. Um, and let me just grab my chat, open that up, make sure I'm not missing anything. And I like to grab all of my little squares and. Every now and then I'll ask you guys questions and make sure you're still with me or ask you for thumbs up and, and stuff like that. Okay, so depreciation, amortization, and inventory methods. Um, well, like why do we care? So we've talked about depreciation. This is something that many of you kind of understand. Um, you know, we talked about it when, when we were thinking about cash flow statements and how it affected it. We looked at our income statements and how depreciation was an expense. It's, you look, you talked about it a lot in accounting, and it's one of those things that's just always that, um, a difficult thing for some people to wrap their head around, or um, just a thing that you didn't realize you really needed to, to know about and care about. Like, we know that we need to make money. We know we have to pay expenses. We don't really understand that we have to reduce the assets that we have in our business consistently. Because as we use them, they become less efficient. They start to wear and tear and break down. Um, and the same way that we, you know, when you buy a car and it has zero kilometers on it, it's worth $30,000. Two years later, when you put 60,000 kilometers on it, it's not worth that amount. And the whole idea is that you can't say that it's worth that amount. You have to have a, um, a strategy. So we have depreciation methods that we look at um, you know for cars they, they have the things called like the black book and that basically tells you the depreciation they always say when you buy a new vehicle and we use vehicles the most because it's really an easy example most people drive or or at least have ridden in a vehicle um, they know or know people who have bought them when you drive it off the lot you lose 40 percent of the value that's their depreciation it's not actually true um, but they're basically saying um, they want, they, there's a process in which these assets depreciate or lessen over time. So we will be looking at four different ones. Um, one of which, and the one that we've only really been seeing so far is straight line. So straight line just means every single year it's worth the exact same amount less. So it's worth $5,000 less every single year. It's an easy way of doing it. That's what you learned in your accounting class, I believe. What we'll look at, um, as well is some of the estimated useful life. So depreciating things based on actual outputs. So how many hours did we have on our four wheeler? How many kilometers did we drive our vehicles? Um, and then we'll look at some other different ways. Depreciation also provides a method of allocating the cost of an asset over time. Um, so when we think about this, you might, and we also look at this as when we need to purchase things as well. So we say, okay, we know that there's a, a specific item we expect it to last us five years or so. There is a depreciation expense. So the, that's the amount that uh, the amount of depreciation that we declare in a year. And there's accumulated depreciation, which is how much the, the asset is depreciated over a span of time, right? And eventually it'll just get to a point where it's not worth anything anymore. And it could actually be worth zero, but you still be using it. So as an example, if you have a TV, um, like I have this really crappy 26 inch TV kind of up here on a shelf. Um, it's not worth anything. It's eight years old. It, it has to pre like, even if I put it up online, I can maybe get $20 for it. And people aren't even going to be willing to drive out this far for $20. So there's an accumulated depreciation where eventually it's not worth anything. You still might be in use in a company, but it's generally um, can't sell for much. 
what is a contra account? So a contra account means uh, contrary or opposite. And there are very few contra accounts in accounting. We've talked about it before in your, or you guys have looked at it in your original accounting class. It's usually linked to another account and records decreases in the value. So this is done. So the original value of the related account remains unchanged. Basically saying accumulated depreciation is a contra account. So we will have the cost of our automobile, $30,000, which is an asset. This is what it is worth. But then we have this contra account, which is, it works in opposite. It is contrary to the, the amount that we think. So because we have $14,000 of accumulated depreciation, it is now worth only 16,000. We use some really like big words in which people get easily confused. Really, we're just saying, hey, we have a vehicle, we bought it at 30, we've driven it and used it a bunch. It's now no longer worth that much. Now it's probably worth 16,000. And this is our estimate. There's not some organization or governing body that will tell you what your asset is worth or how much depreciation it's, it's gone down. Um, really, it's kind of up to you as a business owner to decide what is the value? Usually the market will tell you, you know, you go online and see what, what people are selling things for, see what used vehicles are going for. You'll get an idea of the value of your vehicle. So there are different methods um, of which we will be looking at here today. You're definitely going to need to know the units of output, activity depreciation one, as well as the straight line depreciation. Those are the two most common. Um, so uh, straight line is the same depreciation charge over the entire useful life. The reducing balance is depreciation expense decreases at a constant rate as the life of the asset progresses. So this could be like it depreciate, depreciates 10% every year, whereas in this one right here can depreciate $5,000 every year. The sum of the year's digits depreciation declines by a constant amount as the life of the asset progresses and the units of output, which we'll also be looking at, it ch uh, charges varies each period in proportion to the change in the level of activity. We are a seasonal business. Um, you know, we have busier years and less busy years. And I bet you during COVID, a lot of the uh, resorts and a lot of the, the hospitality areas didn't receive as much business, therefore probably wouldn't have depreciated their things as much. So hopefully that gives you an idea. This is just a little chart to give you a feeling uh, of how these different things work, right? So it, this shows a cost of a fixed asset at $100,000 and the useful life is four years. They give you some machine hours, they give you different rates, but it's just kind of kind of to say like, we're all going to depreciate. We just have different ways in which that we do it. We will be looking at units of activity, which is this pink line and straight line, which is just the straight line all the way across. Okay, so th this is some information. I'm not gonna actually read this. Please read this particular slide or make sure you are able to review it for the test because it'll be talking about some of the advantages and disadvantages of these four different styles of depreciation. Um, again, like I said, units of activity is, is the most time consuming, but it is the most accurate, I believe. And then straight line is the least time consuming, um, but it, it's quick and it's easy. And, you know, if sometimes we only have so much time in which to do everything and we can't spend 40 hours in the week worrying about how our tract, our lawn tractor has depreciated. Um, so this is fast and easy. Okay, so straight line method. Here we go. So uh, the, this is the um, formula. Again, in all of your tests, you will always have the formulas. I will provide the formulas. In your in-class assignments, you'll be looking at this, a very similar thing as well, where we will do a couple um, activities together. I will give you the formulas and the answers, and then I'll just give you a new set of numbers to work with that you have to do on your own, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna practice, we're gonna look at the answers, we're gonna go back and make corrections, and then we get to actually do it again. So this first one here is straight line method. We take our annual depreciation. So how much every year does it going to go down? 
we need three different uh, numbers in which to do this. We need the original cost, what we think we'll get out of it at the end of its timeline, our end of its life. So we call that the salvage value. So what do you think you're gonna be able to sell it for? And then the estimated useful life. So they say a tour bus costing $12,000 with a $2,000 salvage value and a useful life of five years. Okay, so we do the top one first, 12,000 minus 2,000 is 10,000. We divide that by five years, this will depreciate every $2,000 every single year. So this is the straight line, um, or one divided by five, will also tell you that this bus will lose 20% of its value every single year until the end. Um, rather, we can also look at the units of output. So we have this tour bus, but we also know that it's going to drive a bunch of kilometers. And, you know, if we bought a brand new tour bus and, it be, and then pandemic hit or whatever it might have been, and it sat in a parking lot, it didn't go down $2,000 in value. It was barely uh, driven. So let's look at units of output. So it's a little bit different. Um, the beginning starts the same where it's cost minus our salvage value. So that'll still be 12,000 minus 2,000. Uh, divided by the estimated entire life output. Now we have to figure out what this is. So is it kilometers? Is it hours? Um, you know, is it units? We don't really know. And, and it's going to be all different depending on what you actually have, like what the piece of equipment is. But for vehicles, it's easy. It's usually kilometers. So they expect to be able to drive this uh, tour bus at least 200,000 kilometers. So what they'll be doing is say 12,000 minus two is 10, divided by 200,000, 200, and then multiplied by the annual units of output. So the annual units of output. So if a bus travels 14,000 kilometers in one year, what would this be? So we found out that 12,000 minus 2,000, 10,000, divided by 200,000 is, it depreciates about five cents per kilometer. So now we say, okay, we drove it 14,000 kilometers this year. It would only depreciate $700. So when we think about our balance sheet, right? What are we worth? Balance sheet, assets, liabilities, owner's equity. That's what balance sheet has always been. A, a vehicle, a tour bus is an asset. Would you rather have your asset be worth $12,000? Um, or sorry, would you rather have this asset be worth uh, $10,000, what we expect that $2,000 depreciation was when we looked at straight line, or if we did a little bit more work and dug a little deeper, we would only depreciate at $700. So we're saving, or we look like we're $1,300 better off. Um, and that's because we looked at it a little bit more scientifically. So those are the two different uh, ways that we will be looking at both straight line and units of output. So here's another example. So Mike brought Mike Hardware, <laughs> the stupid name, bought a new 70-inch television worth $4,500. He expects his TV to last him five years. The salesman at the store where he bought the television has also told him the TV is expected to last 40,000 viewing hours. Mike's hardware uses uh, 11,000 the first year, 11,000 hours. So what I would ask of you is determine the two types of depreciation for the first year. The residual value um, is 750. So we're going to do straight line, and then we'll do the other one. So straight line right here, it's cost minus salvage value divided by estimated useful life. So here is 4,500 minus 750 divided by uh, five years, which is 3,750 divided by five. It's 750 uh, per year. This little chart right here is great because it kind of just shows us the timeline of this asset. So we think this TV is worth um, this much money over five years. So the annual depreciation starts at zero and zero and it's 4,500. So that line is, it's brand new off the truck or out of the store. And then every year we depreciate 750. The accumulated depreciation is just that 750 plus another 750 plus another 750 and it keeps going up. And you can see the book value of what it's worth keep going down as it's used. So again, straight line. At the end of that fifth year, the expectation is that you could have sold that TV for 750. <coughs> if you wanted to get a new TV three years into it, 
you would try to sell a TV for $22.50. Now, I don't know if you would be able to do that. <coughs> Sorry, one second. Get a tickle in my throat. Um, you might be able to. I could see you getting seven fifty for it. I could see you buying a brand new TV, owning it for less than a year, and maybe getting thirty seven fifty. People might look for a deal, um, but that's the problem with straight line. It's not one hundred percent accurate. <clears throat> and the next one is units of output method. So very similar to what we did earlier, we look at the cost minus salvage value, which will still be thirty seven fifty, divided now by the estimated entire life output, which is forty thousand. 40,000 hours, and then we multiply by the annual units of output. So 3750 divided by 40,000 40, hours will give us 0 .0 0 0.09375. So basically, for every hour that we watch this TV, it goes down in for in 9 cents. And it's not a lot, but every hour that TV's on, it's, it's worth 9 cents less, 9 cents less, 9 cents less. And then eventually you watch 11,000 hours or it's on for 11,000 hours. Um, it will depreciate by $1,031.25. Um, any questions on those two forms of depreciation? Give me a thumbs up if you have a pulse and a heartbeat. Three people are alive. There, there's some more. There we go. Perfect. Okay, I know. Thrilling stuff. Thrilling stuff. Um, diminishing balance depreciation and dep um, is also an example here. Now, we will not have you do this, um, just so you know. So it's just a little bit more information. I'm not going to test you on that, so we can move on. Um, depreciation expense also reduces income. So we, when we look at our cash flow, we were doing that. We were, we were reducing our income on our income statements and we're adding it back into our cash flow because it's actually not an expense. We don't pay depreciation expense to someone and they take it from us. We just reduce our income because we assume that this is um, coming off our, of our assets. Uh, it is taxed. It, it we refer to depreciation as a capital cost allowance. You're not really gonna need to know this kind of stuff um, after its useful life. An asset is sold for more than its book value. The difference is recapture of accumulated depreciation. So this this can increase your income and your income taxes. So if an asset is sold for less than book value, the difference is a loss and maybe an expense against income, thus reducing your income taxes. So. Uh, let's just kind of put it to a, an example. You have a brand new iPhone, not brand new. You have a two-year-old iPhone 11. What are we up to, 13 or 14 now? Um, let's say an iPhone 11. It's two years old. There's a book value of $200 on this phone. Now, if you're an actual business, you know, we're not going to deal with a single phone. But let's say that we are a Rogers store and we have 1,000 iPhone 11s. Um, and we think the book value is 200, 200 bucks. That's what our value is, our cost is into it. Um, that's what we want to get out of it. If we were to sell them for $150 each, because we just want to get rid of them, we want to bring in whatever the new generation phone is, then what's going to happen is that this will be a loss, but we can write this against our income taxes or reduce our income taxes saying, I had a thousand phones at $200. I sold them all for 150. So that's $50,000 less than I would have had. So I can actually reduce my income by $50,000 because I took this loss. On the opposite side, if we had them all and we th thought they're all worth 200, but our sales team is awesome and they're able to sell all these phones for $300, we made an extra $100,000 off these phones. That will be taxed because you're saying you have one thing but you, it's obviously worth much more. And that's why we depreciate things. If we didn't depreciate things and they're still worth the $1,200 that this phone is, all of a sudden they're going to say, okay, that $1,200 phone, you know, you just sold for whatever amount 
uh, that you're that you said it's 1200 but it's not worth 1200 so we're gonna have to tax you on all of that money in between and it's it just doesn't it's not good for business so that's why companies must appreciate stuff as we go through again good 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 thrilling information I know uh, amortization is a different thing so it's paying off debt with a fixed repayment schedule in regular installments so you may have a car loan some of you might have a mortgage where you must you have amortized um, your debt so you're paying this off over a long period of time with in a regular installments even like your tuition you might pay that or your OSAP or any kind of funding that you have any loans um, it also refers to the spreading out, out of capital expenses for tangible assets over a specific time so why do we know why is amortization important um, it is similar to depreciation which is used for tangible assets and to depletion so it goes right to it's where it's no longer worth anything or it goes right to the point where it is only worth whatever our salvage value is so uh, and as, as an example if a company buys a ream of paper it writes off the cost in the year of purchase and generally uses all the paper in the same year with a larger asset the business reaps the rewards of this expense for years so writes off the expense slowly over many years um, just gives you a little bit of, of idea of what amortization is when we think of amortization when it comes to the most common uh, time that it's used or the time this word is used is with a mortgage right so amortization schedule for a residential mortgage is a table that provides a breakdown of scheduled payments over a certain amount of time so I'm just trying not to get too deep into this stuff because some of it you, it's good to know and some of it's kind of not you don't really care um, so as an example when you get a mortgage you usually get like a five-year mortgage but it's amortized over 30 years, which means you're paying it over 30 years, but we have a five-year term in which we're gonna talk about. It looks like here a six-year term that we're actually going to be talking about. So here you say the loan amount's $100,000. I pay uh, interest of 6% a year. It will be over 30 years. I'll make 360 payments. The monthly payments is $600, but by the end of this whole loan I will have paid 115,000 in interest because I'm going to have to pay all that interest for 30 years so you can see how these amortization schedules you're not taking a loan for hundred thousand dollars you're taking a loan for much more than that typically okay so that's I'll put that to rest for right now that's depreciation really what you need to know of that uh, particular section is straight line depreciation, uh, units of output, how to work both of those, and then I want you to be able to go through and answer some multiple choice true and false questions on, you know, what is a depreciation, how does it kind of work, what is amortization as a definition. You don't need to actually do any financials with any amortization. The next one is break-even analysis, which is much more relevant to the world and what we are going to be doing. Um, basically determines the volume of sales revenue or number of units sold required to pay fixed cost plus your variable cost. So it's break-even. So what do I need? Um, if I am the Toronto Raptors, how many seats do I need to sell to be able to pay for all the staffing and the heat and the hydro and the equipment and blah, 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 blah. All of the stuff that might be at the, uh, it's not the Air Canada Center anymore, the Scotiabank Center, right? So it's all the fixed costs, which might be loans and, and payroll and stuff, plus variable costs, which is for every person that comes into that venue, that every, every person that buys a ticket, I'm going to have to have cleaners and I'm going to have to have um, food uh, salespeople and and ticket check-in and all that kind of stuff so there's a variable cost as well so we'll look at some really kind of basic examples um, and then we'll we'll get into the actual assignment so the break-even technique so basically what we look at this here is fixed cost 1650 okay so we need we know that regardless we're always going to have to pay 1650 
And then the variable cost is $350 per unit. Our selling price is 500. So it costs us 350 for, per unit. If we sell it for 500 and we have a fixed cost of 1650. So let's just say that this is mattresses for whatever reason. Okay. So, you know, by time we, we order the mattress in, the driver drives it to the, the, the showroom. We pay our staff to sell things and, and Tra um, delivered to homes and stuff like that, we think it costs us about 350. Now it's variable, right? So this number will change over years. One month it might be 350. Next month we, you know, gas goes up, it's 400. Um, our prices could also go up. Our fixed costs will stay the same. So what they have to do here is determine uh, the break even point. So at what point do we actually are, we're not making money, but we're not losing money. So 500, which is the selling price, X. X is for how many do we need to sell equals 1650 plus 350X, okay? So this is going to be your formula. It's always going to be the selling price, X, which is X is how many units, um, equals 1650 plus 350X. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to move over the 350X and subtract it from here basically showing us this is our take home amount from that cell. Selling price minus variable cost is 150. So we make $150 for every time we sell one. So then all we could do is 1650 divided by 150 is 11 items. That is the break even analysis for this particular, let's say mattress. Um, we'll have a couple examples. We'll work through a few, through a few things. So if it seems a little foreign still to you, that's okay. Um, there's another alternate technique. So I put a couple of little acronyms up here so you understand what we're talking about. So BEP stands for break even point. That's what we're looking for. BEPX is the break even point units. So how many units need to be sold or the BEP dollar amount sign, which could also be the break even point sales. So how much money in sales do we need to bring in in order to break even. So uh, the BEPX right here, so we're gonna go with units, it's fixed cost over selling price minus variable cost. So this might be an easier way for you to look at it uh, instead of, because sometimes when you throw X's in there and you move it from on different sides of equal signs, people forget um, that kind of math. It's like grade six and seven math now, but that was a long time ago, like especially for me, but for you as well. Um, that stuff that you learn and don't don't use every day. So this one right here, it's 1650 fixed cost divided by 500 minus 350. So same thing we did before, which uh, leaves you with 1650 divided by 150, which is 11. Or over here, it's BEPX, which is the break even point unit times the selling price. 11 times 500 is 5500 dollars. So we either need to sell 11 or $5,500 worth of mattresses. Okay, operating leverage. So once break-even point is achieved, each additional unit sold will produce a relatively large percentage increase in profit. So this is the, the sweet point, right? I sell 11, I make $0 when I sell 11. Our business, is just paying for itself. Now, after everything that I sell, we make more money because we've already paid for our fixed cost. We don't need that portion of it. So now we're just keeping it all. all we produce 150 every time we sell one, we keep 150. It's not going to pay any of our fixed costs. So this profit represents, and we've heard this before, the contribution margin on each unit sold. So now we've paid for all of our stuff and now we're going to start banking actual money. We also want to reduce variable costs as much as we can. So there's, there's always, there's two things you can do in any business in the world. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. I don't care if you're in telecommunications, you sell cars, you're in hospitality, you sell t-shirts, you are a paper printer, who cares? Um, what you can do is either increase what you sell the, the selling par, uh, price of it. So increase revenue or you can de decrease costs. When people bring in consultants and you always hear people like, oh, we hired a consultant. 
usually not a good thing for a lot of businesses because what consultants do is that they they work on reducing variable costs as opposed to increasing revenue because some it's it's more difficult to increase revenue although it's much better for a business to do that it's easier to reduce variable costs because we're as humans we can be lazy you know like we say okay I know I can get on my staff and I can make them work more efficiently. I know we can probably streamline something over here, but if you're doing okay and life is okay, then you don't look at that kind of stuff. Usually what happens when you bring in this consultant and they want to reduce variable costs, labor is the first thing to go. Um, I generally, I, I did some consulting before. I always worked on increasing revenue because when you remove labor, you, you make people mad and we, while business is numbers, it's also a lot of humans and human emotions. And if all of a sudden everyone goes from 40 hours a week to 32 hours a week, you pissed off a lot of people and you might lose some good people. And um, it usually results in some uh, poor uh, goodwill to the company. So, fix, uh, so this is ways that we do it. But if we can reduce variable costs in a great way, which maybe is delivery, uh, then we have put more money towards our fixed costs we'll pay off that quicker we don't need to sell 11. if we reduce our fixed cost by let's say 50 dollars, maybe you only have to sell nine this just gives you a little idea of our break-even chart um, so right here would just be that sweet spot if once you sell it looks like 450 of this item and this is where the cost is it gives you that's our break-even point and as we sell more, we make more. And of course, as we sell less, we will be in what we call a loss corridor. Um, this is the fixed cost line. So this is how much we're always going to have to pay. And then everything else is bonus. So it just gives you a different viewpoint of what it could look like um, going through. So then, then we don't we don't just sell mattresses. Like that's not what we do. Most businesses don't sell multiple or don't sell just one item. They sell multiple items. Um, so in this case, we must have a break-even equation to set up in terms of the percentage relationships. If you remember food and beverage cost controls, this would have been menu mix or menu popularity. That's that percentage relationships where if you have 10 appetizers on a menu, they each represent 10% of the appetizer menu, okay? 10 appetizers, appetizer menu, it's, there's 10 of them. They all represent 10% of that menu. But people don't come in and order exactly, how, like 10% of the time they order this one and 10% of the time they order the other one. It's, it's mixed, you know? 40% of the people order the spinach dip and only 5% of the people get the crab cakes and only 2% of the people get the cheese bread, who knows? So those percentage relationships aren't set by us, but it'll give us an idea. Once we have a, a week of sales or a night of sales, you can look at it and, and use that historical information. So, um, where did I go? Here we go. So percentage relationship. So we're gonna assume our costs are $30,000. Our variable costs equal 70% of selling price. So. 30,000 is our fixed cost, variable cost is 70% of whatever we sell it. And that's a pretty reasonable number when you think about it, because we've always talked about food cost and beverage cost and labor. Uh, food beverage cost, 30, 35%, labor, probably 30, 35% at least. Um, that is that 70%, All right? So if I'm selling hamburgers, right? I'm selling burgers, I say, okay, well, automatically for every burger I sell, I lose 70% of it to pay for the meat, the bun, the lettuce, the cheese, the blah, 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 and to pay for uh, Amandeep to flip it and put it on a bun and wrap it up and serve it nicely and smile. So those are the costs that come with it. So what kind of revenue am I going to need to make? So revenue equals fixed cost plus variable cost. So $30,000 plus 0.7 R. So R stands for revenue. So 0 0.07 is the same thing as saying 70%. So 30,000 plus 0 0.7 R. If you move this onto the other side where it's now one R minus 0 0.7 R will leave you with 0 0.3 R. Don't get confused just because there's just a letter here. Okay, it's a, we're saying I have one, I, remove, I 
know that I have to take away 70% of this revenue to pay for my selling price, I will be left with 30%. 30% of my 0.3 of my revenue is um, equals $30,000 my fixed cost. Therefore, if I divide that, I will have to make $100,000 in which to pay for my fixed cost of $30,000. Because 70% of that $100,000 goes to pay my variable costs, my food costs, my beverage costs, my labor costs. The rest goes there. So that's my break even. Um, $100,000 and then anything above that I get to keep. Another example here is, so our fixed cost is $3,000 per month. This is our multi-product example. So it's sandwiches, a drink, and a baked potato. Um, it gives us three different prices. It gives us three different amounts of cost. And what we have to do is we have these annual forecasted sales units. So how many did we sell last year? Probably they're saying we'll probably sell this year, or maybe they add on a little bit extra. So here you go. Um, so what we would do with this is put this into this nice little chart like this. So first of all, we're going to find out what our revenue would be of these three items. Should we sell what they said that we expect to sell? So it tells us here, 9,000, 9,000, 7,000, and these are the prices. So we expect to sell $45,000 worth of sandwiches, thirteen fifty dollars worth of drinks, and $14,000 worth of potatoes we will have a revenue of about 72,500. Our total variable cost is we're taking exactly what our variable costs were of those items, multiplying it by the same amount of units we expect to sell, and we get this variable cost of 38,500. So now we have to find our gross margin, which is what's the money we made and how much did it cost us to make it, which is essentially just the actual cost of goods that we sold. And it doesn't matter what it is. I'm not including labor in this. I'm not including uh, different costs in the business. I'm saying, hey, if I, I bought a bottle of wine and I sold it, how much did it cost me to buy the bottle of wine? What did I sell it for? So here we have uh, 7250 minus 3850 leaves us with $34,000. We also want to see what is this as a percentage? So if we, our gross margin is 34,000 out of a possible 72,500, we kept 46.9% of that amount of money. So this means based on the sales above, you keep 46.9% of that money. Um, so what we're gonna do now is look at our fixed costs. So our fixed costs is $3,000 per month. We have 12 months of this, so it's $36,000 annually. So we expect to spend $36,000 annually. So now our break even point is total fixed costs divided by our gross margin percentage, which is 46.9. So 36,000 divided by 0.469 equals $76,759 and six cents. So basically we did not break even with what we're looking at. We needed to make $76,800, let's call it. We are only selling $72,500. So we're just a little bit shy. We needed to pay our fixed costs of $36,000. We only kept $34,000. We're shy about $2,000. So we're a little light. Um, this would be a business that wouldn't break even, which means it would probably not be successful. So you would have to either, again, raise your revenue, which maybe I'm raising my prices. And if I were just to raise my prices 25 cents on all of these, I would probably make enough money or reduce my cost. And same thing, if I can reduce my cost of a sandwich to 250 or a potato to 75 cents, then I could probably um, not only break even, but make some money. So that's why it's important in this kind of thing, because you have to set these prices in advance. You have to understand these variable costs in advance because all of a sudden, 12 months later, I'm $2,000 short from even paying for all the stuff that I sold. Not, never mind making an actual income on top of this. I basically worked for free minus $2,000. You would have to tweak and change this. Okay. <laughs> um, 
man, I wish I was in class with you right now. This would just be so much easier. Such is life. So that is, in a nutshell, um, both the, the content for break-even analysis as well as uh, depreciation. Underneath your weekly learning, there is an in-class activity. Scroll all the way down here. Week 11, break-even, and we have this in-class depreciation break-even analysis. Now, this is not what you're submitting. This is something that you are... We are just doing together to ensure that you understand it. So you can either open this up um, or you can just kind of watch what I'm doing and follow along. Either one would probably help you. And this is week, it's not the one. It's like, sorry. Okay. So I have a bunch of different examples here for you. So I hope that'll help. Um, the first one here is Michael Agama, the owner of Punjab Pizza, is considering a new oven in which to bake the firm's signature dish of vegetarian pizza. So oven type A can handle 20 pizzas an hour. The fixed costs with oven A are $20,000 and the variable costs are $2 per pizza. Oven B is larger, can handle 40 pizzas an hour. The fixed costs associated with oven B are $30,000 and the variable costs are $1.25 per pizza. They both will sell the pizzas, regardless of oven, for $14 each. Um, so I was already in there doing the answers. I shouldn't have done that. Don't mind me. Okay. So first thing that we have to do is figure out for what is the break-even point for each oven. So we know a few things. We know our fixed costs. It's either $20,000 or $30,000. And we have a, a lesser variable cost. So it's $2 per pizza versus $125. So that's the thing that we're looking at. We're saying, okay, um, so I just had a quick question. Sorry for interrupting. Johar, if you're looking for the assignment, there is an assignment under the assignments tab. But what we're doing now is the weekly learning, just the in-class activity that we do with each other. It's under weekly learning right at the very bottom um, of Blackboard. So that's what we're doing right now. We're not doing the assignment. I will show you the assignment after we go through this. So this is our formula, fixed um, divided by selling price minus variable cost. So for oven A, this is going to equal $20,000 divided by, uh, and it's $14 per pizza, and the top one will give us $2. So oven A, again, is going to be quite simple, where it's $20,000 divided by 12. Uh, and let's do that. So 1,666 pizzas is our break-even point for oven A. So if you want to do oven B, then it's a similar thing, where it's $30,000 now, you can do a lot quicker math than what I'm doing. I'm just really kind of putting it all out there so you can see it. So it's 1 minus $1.25. Again, oven B will equal $30,000 divided by twelve seventy-five, dollars And then our final answer is $30,000 divided by twelve seventy-five. dollars $2,352. So that's basically saying our break-even point is that we will have to sell 2,352 pizzas in which to pay for a $30,000 uh, oven. Or we had to sell 1,600 to pay for a $20,000 oven. Now that's okay. And when you originally look at that, you say, well, that seems like a lot of money. Like, I don't know if I'm going to sell that many pizzas. The oven A obviously stands out as something that you should buy first because it just seems like a less risky Thing. Now, that being said, if you were to sell 9,000 pizzas, which one should you purchase? Right? So what we're going to look at is if we sell 9,000 versus if we sell uh, 12,000, which oven would you want to purchase? So here you're going to start looking at, okay, oven A, it's basically uh, 12 times, so that's 12, uh, $12 a pizza is what we're selling it for after our variable cost. 
and then we're going to times it by 9,000, and that will equal 10,000 or $108,000 of MB because it's probably more efficient. It's 1275 times 9,000. And then what your, what your math is going to be here, let me just move this so it's the same thing. I'm going to go 1275 times 9,000. And we're going to see two different amounts. So if I sell 9,000 pizzas over the year, I'm either going to make $108,000 or I'm going to make $114,000. Now, automatically, your mind might say, okay, well, I want to make 114, but we can't forget that we have to remove the cost of those of the ovens. So this is just us selling them. So we're actually only going to make $88,000 or we're only going to make 84, seven, 84, 750, right? So this is, this is the amount right here, minus 20,000. And this is the amount right here, minus 30,000 for oven B. So we would still want to stick with oven A if we think we sell 9,000. Now, same thing, and I'll just do it a little bit quicker. Um, if we're going to sell 12,000 pizzas, which one should we do? So I'll just do the math a little bit more quickly. $12 times 12,000 or 1275 times 12,000. And I could even do this minus 20,000 right in there. And this one is minus 30,000. When you are doing these formulas, just be aware um, that you just got to be a little careful with your brackets and things like that because this it's you know bed mass so brackets go first exponents multiply division multiplication addition subtraction so as long as i'm ensuring that my formula works it's fine otherwise i would have to put a bracket here and then a bracket here just to make sure that it's all properly done either way at this level oven a is still going to make you more money than oven b because it's going to make you 123,000 versus 124. So it's off by a thousand. So then you want to say, okay, at which volume should Mr. Agama switch ovens? All right? So we want to know, is there a certain level that we want to uh, actually get to? So there's a couple ways of doing it. I'm going to pull this in from, I've given you lots of answers. So if you look back to your actual, um, uh, PowerPoints, They're, they have these formulas here for you. So one, you can just do a stab in the dark. So this is one that we did here, it's 14,000 pizzas. So at 12,000 pizzas, it didn't make any sense. So let's try 14,000. So 14,000, we did our 14,000 times either 12 or 1275, minus our 20 or $30,000. And you see here that finally oven B will actually now make you $500 more if you're selling about 14,000 pizzas. At 13,500, you're off by about, oven B still works, and you're only making about $125. Um, you can also solve for X. So this is just a different way of doing it. It's a little bit more complicated, but if you understand how this works, is they're basically saying here, one pizza costs us, we make 12, um, 75 on, but it costs us $30,000 to do that. The other pizza we make $12 on, but it costs us $20,000 to use the equipment. So then again, you look here and it says, okay, so what's the difference between the 1275 and 12 at 75 cents? What's the difference between the 30,000 and 20,000? It's $10. So we're essentially paying $10,000 difference to get a 75 cent reduction in our costs. And what we're asking ourselves is, does that make sense? Do we make enough or do we sell enough that that 75 cents is going to make up $10,000 eventually? Um, and if you're selling, I, I don't know how much a Domino's would sell pizzas in a day. Um, like if, let's just say, okay, put this in a chat. How many pizzas do you think like a Domino's would sell in a day? Take a stab at it. Or is that low? 50? 
does anyone here have any pizza place experience? Like, what do you what do you think you'd go through today? I'm looking for some answers too. Seventy, someone says. Seventy seems light. They're open from eleven a.m. probably till or ten a.m. even until two in the morning. How many? So this is the kind of math I kind of love. Like I know it's nerdy, but I like breaking down this stuff. You say, okay, if you're open for at least twelve hours, selling ten pizzas an hour is is nothing. You probably sell a lot more than that. So if you're open for twelve hours, then you're probably selling at least. 20 pizzas an hour. So let's say 240. So 365 times 240 is 87,000 pizzas, which is crazy. So Agama's Punjab Pizza Place is not uh, very popular if they're only selling 14,000. So if you are selling something like that, even if it's half of that, even if it's selling 10 pizzas per hour, Oven B is going to really help you out. In this particular scenario where we're not really sure, we are making 75, we are reducing our cost by 75 cents. We have to sell 13,000 pizzas um, exactly. So $10,000 divided by 0.75, we sell 13,000 pizzas exactly in which to be able to get um, that break even point between the two. So where it doesn't make sense or it doesn't change either oven A or oven B, but once we go more and more and more, and if you ever were to sell, 87,000 pizzas, well, let's, times 12, that is not math, hold on, you would have it, yeah, so if you ever sold 87,000 pizzas, 600, which you would have a difference of like quite a bit of money, $60,000. So have you ever got to that level? So this is this is the thing where I'm talking about. This is a break even and crossover analysis. What we're doing is that we're looking at pieces of equipment. If they are going to be able to reduce our costs or reduce our labor associated with this, at what point do they make sense, right? Um, from where do we get 14,000 in D section? Can you please tell me? So 14,000, I, I, just, I just did. I just said, okay, well, when you're looking at here, 12,000, and I wasn't sure, I just said, why don't we try 14,000? So I really am just kind of guessing that at 14, we are at 12, we were really close between the two. We are off by about $1,000. So let's try 14,000, and then we are up by 500. And I tried 1350. It was just, you slowly work your way to it, or you can do this one, right? I would accept, even if you, uh, did this answer here where he said at about 1350 is where you start making money that would be fine you've done the math you've done the work I don't need to know that it's 13,333 pizzas exactly um, I just need to know that you've done some investigating and you've done some math to figure out at what's that break-even point okay next one so that is a single item looking at a so this right here was a single item, one pizza, one dollar amount, and just a different variable cost between the two based on a different piece of equipment. Um, now, it doesn't really work like that always. Instead, we might have multiple products. So we're not gonna go through an entire menu or anything, but what we have is a little theater company that sells snacks. So it's a little concession sales area. Um, so what you would be responsible for doing is trying to figure out what is your break even dollar amount for this this evening. So you estimated that it's going to cost you about $250 in labor and $300 for the booth rental. You're going to consider both of these costs fixed cost. So your fixed cost will be $550 because it doesn't matter. You still always need people there running the concession booth, even if nobody is there. You have four items that you're selling. You're selling them for a, a really, it doesn't really matter the price that we chose. I just threw prices in here. So it's a dollar for a soft drink, a dollar seventy-five for wine, a dollar for a coffee, and a dollar for a, a candy bar. And these are the costs for them. And these are the percentage of revenue or the percentage of sales that we do. So um, 
25, 25, 30, and 20. Okay, so all of these will have to equal 100% total. So 25, 25 is 50, 80, and then eventually 100%. This is how the breakup of the revenue comes in. So more coffee is ordered than anything else. Soft drinks and wine are tied for second, and then candies last. So how we would do this is we have to look at all of our items with no forecast given. So we're, they're not telling us what we expect of how many units to sell, rather just the percentage. So how often do people order what item? So what we will have to do is go through these items, find out the percentage of revenue, uh, and find out the gross margin, which is the selling price minus the variable cost multiplied by the percentage of revenue. So it'll look like $1 minus 0.65 multiplied, I don't know that, why that percentage is there, multiplied by 0.25. Okay, now because of bed mass and everything, that would not um, work. You'd have to put some brackets in there, but it would be $1 minus the 65 cents. Let me just do this a little bit cleaner so it makes more sense. All right, so and that's the equation that you'll be looking at right there. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say, okay, um, brackets one minus 0.65 and bracket times 0 0.25, 0 0.8, 0 0.0875. And what we're gonna keep doing, and this is the, uh, we're gonna keep going through and doing all of this. So this one here will be equals 1.75 minus, 0.95 times 0.25. So the selling price. And you're just going to keep going and doing all that. And then I'm just going to pull the answers here. So um, what we have done, I've done all of these now. One dollar minus 65 cents the cost, which leaves us 35 cents. We times it by 0.25. We actually are keeping it's, it's actually 8.6, but I round it up. So 9%, 20%, 21%, 14%. You add these all up, we have a 64% gross margin percentage. All right? So you're taking all the items in the selling prices, subtracting all of the variable costs, multiplying by their individual percentage of revenue. So what we think is going to be our best seller, a medium seller, and our worst seller. Look at that. Add all those numbers up we think that we will keep 64% of our gross margin, then fixed cost divided by gross margin percentage. So um, if we have $550 um, dollars for our fixed cost, we divide it by 0 0.64, we will need to sell $859 worth of goods, um, to, in which that we can make sure that we break even at the very least. Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. We had to sell at least $860 worth of stuff. Now, if we wanted to go and find out what that actually looked like, then we would just go, so as an example, how much wine would you expect to sell at the break even point? Because we would need to know this for ordering. So if we want to break even, we need to spend, we need to sell $860. How many glasses of wine am I going to sell? So you take the percentage of the wine revenue. So looking back up here, it's 25%. So what is the 25% of $860? So 25% of $860 is $215. $215 of sales comes from uh, glasses of wine at $1.75. So you take your 215, you divide it by $1.75, and you get about 123 glasses of wine that you've sold. So your break even for wine is that you're going to sell 123 glasses of wine. If you know your wine's five ounces, then you know how many bottles you need and so on and so forth. Now, this is just for break even. This is not for the actual sales. Like hopefully you sell much more than this and you make some money. And you could do the same thing for coffee and candy. $860 times 30%. Find out what that amount is and then divide that. Uh, by one dollar will tell you how many coffees. So if I said coffee, um, I, all I would do is 
I'm going to use 860 because it's easy. Divided by or times 0 0.30. We sold $258 worth of coffee and two well, 258 divided by one dollar each is 258 cups of coffee. So it gives you an idea. Um, okay, let's check to see if there's any questions. I know good stuff, good stuff. That is the two break even analysis style questions. One is, again, just to reiterate, a single um, item, different variable cost based on different equipments that we need to, to purchase. Or the second one is multiple units and trying to determine how exactly this uh, works. Now I've given you the answers for both of these. Next one is depreciation. All right, and I know it's, it's a lot, um, but they're fairly easy once you get a, once you know it, you're just plugging values into formulas and then finding out what the answer is. So here we go. So Vanessa purchased a new ride-on lawnmower for her golf course. The piece of equipment is expected to lower her labor in her turf care department, although it's much more expensive than her previous piece of equipment. The new mower costs her 35,000, that's our cost, and it's guaranteed to last, to last at least five years or 10,000 cutting hours. That's our estimated useful life. At the end of the five years, the company has even stated that they will buy the mower back from her for $3,000 for parts. Um, and Archdeep, I can go back there later, yes. Uh, Vanessa expects to use this mower at least four times a day, or four days a week, sorry, eight hours each day. Use the above information to determine both the annual and five years. So please, on both the test and the assignment, I'm asking you the annual depreciation and the five-year depreciation using both the straight line method and units of outlook. So this one here, um, we know our formula. It's our cost, $35,000 minus our salvage value of $3,000 divided by the estimated useful life, which is five years. So 35,000 divided by minus 3,000 is 32, and then 32,000 divided by five. Now you can do that in a single formula line, but you just make sure you get to put brackets in there. So $6,400 is the annual, um, and the five-year is as easy as you can think. Five-year is 6,400 times five years. So over five years, it will depreciate $32,000, and we'll have a remaining salvage value of 3000 The annual is 6400 um, and that's it. Okay, I think we understand that one pretty well. Now, uh, we're gonna do the units of output method, which is a little bit more difficult. So cost minus salvage, so it's still gonna be that 35 minus three. Then we're gonna divide it by the estimated entire life of output, which we they think it'll last you 10,000 cutting hours. Okay, so we say 35 minus 3,000 um, divided by the estimated so it's 10,000 hours. So that would be 32,000 divided by 10,000. So $3.20 it uses or it depreciates for every hour of it driving. Let me make sure I got that right. 35 minus 3,000 divided by 10,000 hours. Yep. So $3.20. Um, it's what the cost is for every hour or depreciation is for every hour. Now she expects to use the mower four days a week, eight hours each day for a year. Although it wouldn't be a year unless you live in Florida, but let's, let's carry on. So four times eight times 365. So she expects to use it 11,680 hours. Let me look at the answers. Sorry, I want to make sure I didn't get this right. Oh, a week, right. Okay. I multiplied that by too much. So $3.20 is the expected cost of depreciation per hour of output. If we expect to use the mower four days a week times eight hours, 32 hours a week times the 52 weeks, we will use this 1,664 hours. 
All right. So if it costs us three dollars and twenty cents, and we're using it one thousand six hundred sixty-four hours, we would depreciate our piece of equipment by five thousand three hundred twenty-four dollars and eighty cents. So that is five thousand two three hundred twenty-four dollars a year based on these units of output. So when you think about a five year, now we don't know if it's gonna be the same, but assuming the five year depreciation is, is around the same amount every year, five times $5,324.80, we would only depreciate our mower by $26,624 versus up here, it was 6,400 times five. So there is a difference of $6,000 or fifty. $400 or so difference between these two amounts. This is the quick, fast, and dirty way. It's easy to do. It's, it's simple. This one here, you're actually kind of trying to determine how many hours that you would be using it. Um, so when you think about that, you might want to use this hours of output as your depreciation method because you would be showing uh, more value on your balance sheet just by the way that you record your depreciation. You'd be worth more, the bank would like you more, you get loans at a better rate, all kinds of good stuff. Now, since based on the above usage amounts, would it be wise for Vanessa to return the mower after five years for her $3,000 salvage amount? If she used the mower five days a week at eight hours a day, would she want to take, <laughs> I can't, There we go. Would you want to take the salvage amount? Okay. So basically we're saying as it is, um, we it's pretty safe to say that using the units of output method, she would depreciate the value of her thing by $5,324 a year. $8,376 is the remaining value of her mower, technically. It would not, she would not take the $3,000 salvage value. It wouldn't make any sense for her. Now, if she used the mower eight hours a day, five days a week, then it would be a lot more hours, 20,000 hours, 6,656. And you multiply that over five years, it's 33,280. So if you would subtract that from our cost, we only have $2,620 remaining in value. Taking that $3,000 salvage amount would actually make sense. So you just see how the the amount of output that you put into a certain piece of equipment will wear it down faster and depreciate the item faster. Thank you, Jay, 52 weeks. Yeah, I saw it late. Okay. So that gives you an idea of exactly what is the expectation. They, that is what I'm asking of you. It's very similar style questions, same numbers, same formula, or different numbers with same formulas. Um, and that's what you're supposed to come up with. Okay. So that is all under weekly learning for you. You can just go through and, and uh, look at that and attempt it on your own. And then when you are ready to do your assignment, you, what you will do is go under assignments. The assignment is actually shorter than the activity. Week 11 in-class uh, assignment and depreciation. This is the submittal link. This is the assignment that you'll be giving to me. Just make sure you don't submit the um, in-class activity. So I'm going to open this assignment and just show you what's happening. Um, okay, so fairly similar. There's a break even. It's a pizza place as well. We're using two different pieces of equipment. We have two different values. Um, and then you have to find out what is the break even with 9,000, 12,000. What oven should I be using? At what volume should Miss Ortiz switch? And then a bonus where we actually look at the individual piece of equipment based on how many pizzas they can handle. And regardless if what your break even is, are you able to select oven A or, or oven B based on sales numbers? So I, this is a bonus, you don't need to do it, but I'll give you some bonus marks and some of you I know need it. Um, so this will be a little bit helpful. You're gonna have to do a little bit of math and a little bit of just, it's not even math, it's arithmetic. You know, it's just logical thinking. Okay, if I'm open this long and this many nights and this is what I sell, can oven B actually handle it or oven A handle it? Um, I need you to show my show your work for the marks though. So walk me through all the steps that you would do. 
for full marks. And then depreciation, it's a big TV for a sports bar. Um, and again, we're using hours watched instead of kilometers as you would on a, a vehicle. And then you just go through and you answer it and make sure you tell me both the annual and the four year depreciation amount because we're only expecting this TV to last for four years. Any questions on that? That you can think of. Sad face. Understood. Um, okay, so what you're going to be doing is you'll go through and complete those assignments and submit them before 2 p.m. today for your 5% mark. Um, you, you have all of the answers, right? You know exactly what the expectation is, you know what you're supposed to be doing, you've seen the, the completion of them and you have the answer key. Now you just have to do it on your own and show me that you understand the process. So go through those and submit them and then that'll be it for this week. Week uh, 12, which is next week, we'll have one more 5% and then week 13, we'll cover labor. Um, so week 12, both of these next weeks I really like. And again, things I like in finance, you probably don't, and I, I don't fault you for it. But next week we look at, should a resort close for the season or stay open based on a whole bunch of different numbers. Um, so you say, hey, do I close down January, February, March, or do I stay open? And, and what is the impact that'll have on a business or not? And that's something that we deal with often. And then week 13, we look at how do I pay people properly uh, or how do, or how do I get paid properly and how much does the tax man get take off? So if you're offering me $60,000 a year, I need to know exactly what my take home amount will be, what my gross amount is, or sorry, my net amount is. So you pay me 60, but the tax taxes come off, the EI comes off, CPP, um, there might be a pension, who knows? Benefits, union dues, all these things that can happen. And then eventually you're left with a smaller amount. And we need to know that because we need to also just plan our life. And, you know, it's nice that I make 60000 on paper, but I'm actually only taking $38,000 home. I'm going to probably budget my life differently. Sorry, I just got a question here. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Jay asks, can we only do the X section in the last part of the breakdown rather than doing the, the assumption? Yes, of course. So that is the proper way of doing it. Yes, you can do that, Jay. Um, and if it's quicker and easier, then 100%. Um, Simran. Simran. Jot. So you get an appointment at 11.40. Simran, I'm okay with that, but you're gonna have to give me some evidence of this appointment at 11:40. Okay, so as long as you send me, you can email me the assignment, but just give me like something to say that this is this is a real appointment that you actually have this, and that's fine. Uh, it is due at 2 p.m. today, so you have just under three hours in which to complete it. Uh, I, I think you can complete it in 45 minutes. By by noon, you should be able to do it. But you have a couple of extra hours if, if you need it. Um, other than that, guys, it's week 11. Like, I'm proud of you for getting this far. It's a few more weeks. And then many of you will be done your um, education for a while anyways. And getting out there and making money and, um, you know, pursuing your career. And it'll be summer and everyone will be happy. I'll stick around a little bit. But if you don't have any questions, just work on the assignment and you guys can log off. Um, otherwise, hang back and ask away. I'm going to get coffee. So when I come back, if there's anyone here, we can chat about whatever you want to chat about. Otherwise, guys, have a great day.
Can you please post? I'm still recording. Yeah, I'll post the recording right now.